Tonight, advocates are calling for immediate action after a recent spate of teen violence. If we do not treat it as a priority, it will get from bad to worse. A 14-year-old and 16-year-old have been arrested for a stabbing at Scarborough Town Center. The violence happening just hours after two teens were stabbed at a Mississauga school. And... By 2031, one in four Canadians will be an older adult. Latest figures from Stats Canada show we now have a larger share of people nearing retirement than those entering the workforce, and that could soon cause some problems. Plus... So that they can get from A to B safely and be very relaxed. A GTA driving school is set to start providing vehicle for high drivers with mandatory training. The new rule coming after a fatal accident involving an Uber driver. Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. Police have charged a 14 and 16 year old in connection with a stabbing last night at the Scarborough Town Center. Two men were hospitalized with serious injuries. The violence just the latest in a recent spate of youth stabbings across the GTA. And as Natalie Collada reports, it has advocates calling for immediate action from all levels of government. We cannot be silent and the young people are screaming and the way they express themselves and and they are taking out as 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 a violence violence caught on video like this a fight yesterday outside a mississauga school that left two students stabbed a 15 year old taken into custody if we just sitting and watching what is happening it's gonna get worse and more public last night a fight broke out at scarborough town center Two people were stabbed. A 14-year-old and 16-year-old are now facing multiple charges, including aggravated assault and assault with a weapon. Advocates are calling for immediate action. When we had the uh, COVID restrictions, uh, youth spaces were the first things to be shut down. They need positive programs. They need positive alternatives. They need positive spaces with people that are willing to engage them. We have that. On a scale of one to 10, maybe at one right now. To change that, they say, will require a deeper understanding of the changing nature of youth violence. I think really what we've got to get at is how do we invest in kids and families generally, including through the health system and mental health system, to try to stop this kind of behavior from happening. But to do that will take political will from all levels of government. This is not one neighborhood issues. It's all of us, the people who are elected representatives, they need to put their head together and find solution. People who are in silence, this is a time they need to speak up. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Just hours after police offered up to $250,000 for information leading to his arrest, the man considered one of Canada's most wanted fugitives was taken into custody. A 32-year-old Abil Aziz Mohammed of Toronto was wanted in connection with the 2021 murder of Craig McDonald. Police announced the unprecedented reward yesterday. Investigators say shortly after anonymous information was received about Mohammed's location. He's now been charged with first degree murder. The family of Craig McDonald releasing a statement on the arrest saying the news this morning came with so many emotions, enormous relief of course, but also sadness because this arrest won't bring Craig back. It does not end this chapter of grief. The only grace it brings is that it allows us to take the next step forward in this most unfortunate journey. New census figures were released today by Stats Canada and what we are learning about our aging workforce could create significant challenges in the next decade. Ali Shiasan digs into the numbers. There's something interesting happening with Canadian demographics right now. Statistics Canada even describes it as... We could even say uh, it's a date with demographic destiny. The Canadian population now has more people aged 55 to 64, you know, the age range where people start to retire, than people in the 15 to 24 age bracket, the age at which people enter the workforce. The gap between those two populations has never been that high as in 2021. According to the census data, one in five Canadians are nearing the age of retirement. And this is a big contributing factor to the labour shortages we're seeing. Immigration is a way to overcome that and narrow that growing gap of working-aged people. Because what happens is 
you are by and large recruiting people who are in that core age group, 25 to 54. Most of them actually are 25 to about 39. But with a plummeting birth rate of just 1.4 children per family, it's not enough. The trouble is, is that when you get into birth rates that are as low as ours, you really can't overcome that deficit through immigration. Meanwhile, the number of Canadians 85 and older has doubled in the past decade, a number that could triple in the next 20 years. A decade from now, where one in four of us will be an older person, there's no time like the present to start fixing the underfunding of our long-term care systems, um, but also making sure that we have a more robust home and community care component. The advocates say this shift between young and old must be addressed by all levels of government, from social supports to housing. So that all of us as we age will have a much more reliable um, system that can support us as we age. Which is kind of the point of the census. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Toronto has approved its first driving school to provide training for all vehicle for hire drivers. The course will be offered beginning next week and will be mandatory for any driver applying for a ride hailing license in order to work for companies like Uber and Lyft. Dale Manukduk has those details. City of Toronto has been uh, has reduced the speeds in different areas. It's this type of Toronto specific training that AMV driving school will provide to students. It will cover basic driving skills, defensive driving, with a focus on pedestrian and cyclist traffic. Not only that, but they will be also learning how to become the ambassador of the city of Toronto. Jim Mitchell helped author the program. I think of working with the city to try and promote both the culture of the city, the diversity of the city, but it also takes in accessibility. Would-be drivers will also go through anti-racism training, but the city says it is physical safety and ensuring the passenger's peace of mind that is of utmost importance. None of us would ever get on a bus or a streetcar uh, without understanding that the TTC would have properly trained their drivers before giving them the responsibility of carrying human life. City Council introduced the mandatory training following the 2018 death of Nicholas Cameron, who was taking an Uber to the airport. But the COVID-19 pandemic put a pause on plans, and the city continued issuing licenses without a training program in place. And only when this created a, a big backlash and cry um, from um, organizations involved with Right Fair TO, um, was it put back onto the agenda and, and literally, um, you know, sped up um, to, to institute. Uber maintains safety is at the heart of the company, says a spokesperson this is an important step forward so drivers can complete their training and get on the road, unlock flexible earning opportunities, help to decrease wait times and provide safe, affordable rides to all Torontonians. The program will cost $250 to complete. The city says not only will future drivers have to finish the training before applying for a license, but those who already have one, including taxi and limo drivers, will have to complete the course as well. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Nick Serenkovich joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, a pretty cold one out there today, complete with frost advisories. Yeah, Calda, definitely on the cold side. Now, you know, to put this in perspective, the average for this time of year, about 15 degrees is a high. Our high today was just 4 degrees. There are also frost advisories in effect for tonight as temperatures once again dip below the zero mark. There's a look at daytime highs that we saw some areas like Kitchener only hitting zero degrees this afternoon. It is coming, though, with clearing sky cover. In fact, we've got clear skies tonight, clear skies for tomorrow, and this kicks off a stretch of sunshine for the GTA that lasts until about the beginning of Sunday. Sunday, sort of afternoon, we're looking at some cloud cover starting to roll in. For the next 24 hours, though, it looks like this, minus one degree with a wind chill of minus three. Not much to speak of in terms of the winds, but nonetheless, we're below zero. Ten for tomorrow and sunshine, not quite at the seasonal mark, but getting close or at least in the double digits. It does, however, get warmer into the weekend. I will have your full five-day forecast. It's coming up in just a bit, Kelda. Okay. Thanks so much, Nick. The Ontario Green Party released part of its election platform today following similar moves from the NDP and the Liberals earlier this week. It includes a crackdown on speculators who drive up the cost of housing and more supportive homes with mental health services. Lisa Sheng has the details. 
As new homes go up in the province, so do the prices, soaring by 44 percent in just two years. Today, the Greens announced their plan to fight that. And that's exactly why we are taking this action today to commit to a multiple properties speculation tax. That tax will start at 20 percent, equivalent to the existing foreign home buyers tax. But for domestic buyers on the third home purchased, that would increase with every additional property. According to recent figures from Stats Canada, people who own multiple properties accounted for 31 percent of Ontario's housing stock in 2019 and 2020. The agency said that increased competition in already tight real estate markets, making it more difficult for prospective homeowners to purchase a home. I think it's a step in the right direction. This urban planning professor says uh, it will help a certain you know, segment of the population, but... How are they going to address the most, you know, vulnerable segments of our population that need the assistance now? The Greens have also promised to build 60,000 permanent supportive homes with mental health services over the next decade if elected and fund half of shelter and community housing costs while municipalities continue to manage them. Earlier this month, Doug Ford's Conservatives announced their plan for housing, which includes speeding up municipal approvals and hiking the foreign buyers tax. The NDP is promising to bring back rent control and build supportive and affordable housing. The Liberals have yet to release a plan. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. With just days now before the provincial election is expected to be called, a coalition of groups and businesses wants to make sure the environment and climate change are campaign issues. Today, they came out with a list of 12 actions they'd like the parties to agree to. Lorena Redekop has more on that. Sean Smith runs a small business designed to improve soil quality. For him, it was a no-brainer to add his company's name to a call for action on climate change. I think uh, climate is the number one issue of our time. In part, it's for his two children. They're very young. What kind of change are they going to see in their lifetime? And I think about Indigenous wisdom that says, think seven generations into the future. Uh, and what is that going to mean as well? Um, and, and they're mind-boggling questions, frankly. Respecting Indigenous sovereignty is one of the 12 actions. Healthcare groups, unions and businesses are part of the movement. Environmentalist David Suzuki and his daughter lent their support. Because there has never been more at stake. Because if the climate fails, every injustice will be amplified. The coalition calls for parties to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, invest 2% of GDP in a zero emissions economy and fossil fuel subsidies, and rapidly wind down fossil fuel use. Plus, bring back the office of the independent environment commissioner. The Ford government scrapped it. There is currently an environment commissioner, though the role is under the Auditor General's office. Well, she has all sorts of things to report on. So the environmental issues are somewhat diluted or lose focus. Here's how the political parties responded to the coalition's calls. Everything that they're asking for is already in our road uh, map to net zero. Our program, which is very aggressive, very bold, is one that's quite compatible with what was put forward today. This plan is an excellent guide and we should try to accomplish as much of the objectives. The PCs didn't respond directly to the coalition's priorities, but says the province is on track to meet its 2030 greenhouse gas emissions target. It says their approach is to be flexible to the circumstances for job creators and not harm Ontario's economic growth. Sean Smith still hasn't decided who he'll vote for, but has this message. Change is possible now, um, and we need politicians who are going to take action now. Lorenda Radicomp, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. He escaped Kabul in a harrowing journey and now calls Scarborough home. But Hadith of Gunfar remains separated from his parents and siblings, despite efforts from relatives here to file a temporary resident visa to bring his family to Canada. Months later, their application still hasn't been processed. Far Morali has his story. Hadith of Gunfar is settling into his new life in Canada, but it hasn't been easy. I miss my brothers. I miss my dad so much. The 10-year-old hasn't seen his parents or brothers since August, when they were separated at the airport in Kabul. Chaotic scenes like these unfolded as thousands tried to flee the country after the Taliban seized power. 
there was a really tough time in the push, and the people were screaming, and a couple of those people were falling on the floor. Hadis held on to his grandfather's hand as the crowds pushed forward, and later made it on a plane out. But the crowd pressure was too much for his mother, who was nine months pregnant at the time. For her safety, she left the airport with her husband and other children. For him, uh, every day, every minute, you know, he asking about his mom, his dad. Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada is prioritizing temporary resident visa applications for Afghans with immediate family in Canada. But nearly seven months after filing an application, Hadith's parents and siblings are still in Pakistan. This is actually one of the most unique cases I have handled. Um, because it involves a minor child. Kamiya Moshirifar is working with the family. Their file has not been processed yet. Uh, we're still waiting for a decision. Um, no matter how many times we follow up with IRCC or call, we're just getting automated replies. In a statement, IRCC wouldn't share details about Hadis's family's case. It told us it remains committed to bringing as many vulnerable Afghans here as possible, as quickly as possible. It's not quick enough for Hadis. The separation now taking its toll. He's feeling very lonely. Uh, he is kind of stressed and depressed. depressed. He is improving, but uh, still, uh, he has uh, nightmares every, every night. Uh, he's crying sometimes. He put his uh, mom in that picture on his uh, bed, you know. More than anything, Hadis is anxious to meet his new younger brother, who he's only met virtually. Asked what the first thing he plans to do when he sees his family. I hugged him. An embrace he hasn't felt in more than eight months, when he hopes he'll feel soon. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. We're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. It was partly cloudy this evening, but has since become clear and making way for some sunshine as we get into the morning. Right now, it is about two degrees downtown. Let's go back to Nick now with a look at your extended forecast. And Nick, we have some sunny days to look forward to for the rest of the week. Yeah, I'd say sunshine is uh, the headline moving through the rest of the week. Also some warming temperatures as well. I mean, today hitting uh, four degrees, which is well below the seasonal mark. We're going to see those temperatures rising, but still a couple overnight lows that are touching the zero mark. So we've got frost advisories in effect again for tonight, but the sunshine begins tomorrow and it's not until Sunday afternoon where we see a shift in our weather pattern once more. Until then though, lots in the way of sunshine. Now clear skies tonight and tomorrow are gonna to help temperatures drop down close to the zero mark. Uh, as we move through tomorrow afternoon though, that sun is getting stronger. We've got uh, temperatures in the double digits. Sunny skies carry us through uh, Thursday night into uh, Friday as well. And in fact, right through till Saturday, it's not until Sunday where a system approaches from the Southwest and that's just the cloud cover that you see here. And that's when we're going to see a bit of a change in our weather pattern. Now, winds uh, a little breezy, but they're going to sort of ease off tonight and then pick up to about 20 kilometers per hour tomorrow uh, as we move through the afternoon. So there's that dip and then the change. And generally speaking, we're looking at winds over the next day to two days up to about 20 kilometers per hour, but it shouldn't be much breezier than that. Forecast for southwestern Ontario tonight, uh, again, down below zero, anywhere from about minus one to minus five out in London under mainly clear skies. And then as we move through the Golden Horseshoe, similar temperatures uh, closer to the lake. You're closer to the zero mark as you move further away, though, minus two, minus three degrees, wind chills of about minus three and clear skies. Double digits tomorrow, but just barely at 10 degrees, 14 on Friday. Saturday looks to be the best of the days at 16 degrees in sunshine, increasing cloud cover and showers on Sunday and Monday showers as well. But at least we're in the double digits for Monday. Yalda. That is true. Toronto's own Matea Roach looking to extend her Jeopardy winning streak tonight and it was a close one. Who is Yates? With just seconds to spare, you wrote down the correct response. And did you wager anything? One dollar with $27,201 today. You are now a 17-day Jeopardy champion. Roach pulling out a 17th win tonight by a margin of just one dollar. She's racked up an impressive $396,000 U.S. so far. A Roach holds the record for the longest winning streak by a Canadian contestant. And, well, she isn't done. 
Amazing. And the Toronto Raptors aren't done yet either. After a day off yesterday, the Raps were back on the practice court today. They host the Philadelphia 76ers tomorrow night in Game 6 of their first round playoff series. And it's another must-win game for the Raptors, but they've got all the momentum on their side. Our Greg Ross sets up the game for us. After dropping the first three games of their series to the Sixers, the momentum has clearly shifted to the Raptors, having won the past two. But Coach Nick Nurse says you can't rely on momentum. I think in basketball the momentum shifts so much during one single game. Uh, we ought to feel good going into it tomorrow, but it ain't going to mean anything because as soon as the ball goes up, we got to play good. Instead, the Raptors will rely on the desperation that has helped them regain the momentum. For the third straight game, their season is on the line. A loss, and they are eliminated. You feel like yeah, we always, um, you know, get a couple slap in the face before we start playing well. So I think um, that last game three, I think it really helped us just realize what we need to do. And um, like I said, losing like that really uh, opens your eyes. Something else the Raptors can rely on is the energy they get from the crowd inside Scotiabank Arena. Not to mention the crowd outside the arena in Jurassic Park. This atmosphere is uh, it's just crazy, it gives you energy. Uh, it's a great to play. Energy means everything. You know, obviously, when we out there, we playing, we can feel it. We hear the loud cheers. We're going to need them for game six because, um, like I said, it's a big game and we can't do it without them, honestly. The Raptors now find themselves at the halfway point of potentially making history as they try to become the first team ever in the NBA to come back and win a series after starting 0 and 3. But coach Nick Nurse says they're too focused on the present to worry about making history. He says all they'll be thinking about tomorrow is winning game six. Like I said, when it was 3-0, so we just got to get one here, right? And, and now we're still just need one. <laughs> still just need one, two games, three games later. If the Raptors can even the series at three games apiece tomorrow night, they'll force a seventh and deciding game in Philadelphia on Saturday. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.